this video, we're going to cover the regulation of fatty acid synthesis and degradation. So by the end of this video, you'll understand the overview picture of how fatty acid synthesis and breakdown are integrated, the key enzymes involved, and how they are allosterically and hormonally regulated. And then we're going to zoom out to see the regulation of fatty acid metabolism in the liver. So let's begin by drawing the fatty acid synthesis and degradation pathway. When we have a high carbohydrate meal, blood glucose levels increase. Glucose enters glycolysis, forming acetyl-CoA, and acetyl-CoA carboxylase catalyzes the formation of malonyl-CoA, which is an intermediate of fatty acid synthesis. The acetyl group from acetyl-CoA is the first acyl group, and then subsequent acyls are from the malonyl group of malonyl-CoA. The fatty acid chain is extended by two carbon atoms after the first cycle. On the other hand, fatty acid oxidation begins with activating the fatty acid and converting it to a fatty acyl-CoA. This is catalyzed by fatty acyl-CoA synthetase. Then in the second step, the CoA is going to be substituted for carnitine to form fatty acyl-carnitine. This is formed in the outer membrane by carnithine acyl transferase 1. So then it's going to move into the matrix by passive transport through the acyl carnithine or carnithine cotransporter. Once it's in the matrix, the fatty acyl group is transferred to CoA, so we're going to be putting the CoA back, and this is catalyzed by carnithine acyl transferase 2, which is found in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So now that we have free carnithine, this carnitine is going to go through the carnitine co-transporter and it's going to move back to the intermembrane space to the outer membrane where it can repeat this process. So then fatty acyl-CoA is going to undergo beta oxidation and beta oxidation has four steps. So this is an overview picture of fatty acid metabolism and in the end you're going to see how these two pathways are regulated. So now let's subtract complexity and go through the regulation of fatty acid synthesis first. Fatty acid synthesis is regulated both allosterically and hormonally. So let's go through how it's allosterically regulated first. Referring back to fatty acid synthesis, it occurs in the cytoplasm, but the acetyl-CoA required is produced in the mitochondria. So in order for the acetyl-CoA to be transported to the cytosol, it needs to be converted to citrate. So acetyl-CoA reacts with oxaloacetate to form citrate, and citrate is transported through the citrate transporter located in the inner membrane, and once it's in the cytosol, it's transformed back to oxaloacetate by citrate lyase, and we regenerate acetyl-CoA. We covered this in great detail in the fatty acid synthesis lecture. Then acetyl-CoA is used to generate malonyl-CoA, which is an intermediate of fatty acid synthesis, and this is catalyzed by acetyl-CoA carboxylase. Now, remember that the acetyl-CoA is the first acyl group, and the malonyl group from malonyl-CoA are the subsequent acyls, and it goes through the four-step process, extending the chain by two carbon atoms per cycle after this first cycle, and we produce palmitate. Now, when we have excess energy, it's converted to fatty acids and stored as lipids. So citrate plays a role in the regulation of fatty acid synthesis. When the cell is producing a lot of citrate, transporting acetyl-CoA out of mitochondria, it's going to increase acetyl-CoA carboxylase activity. So it's going to allosterically activate acetyl-CoA carboxylase because this is a rate-limiting step in fatty acid synthesis. Okay, so citrate is going to allosterically activate acetyl-CoA carboxylase. So that's the activator. Now, the inhibitor of this enzyme is palmitoyl-CoA. It's a feedback inhibitor of acetyl-CoA carboxylase. So that's how acetyl-CoA carboxylase is allosterically regulated. Now, acetyl-CoA carboxylase can also be hormonally regulated, which involves phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. So the enzyme that coordinates fatty acid synthesis is acetyl-CoA carboxylase, or ACC for short, and it exists in two forms. We have the active form and the inactive form, or less active form. In its inactive form, 
it's phosphorylated. So it has a phosphate group. And its active form, where it produces malonyl-CoA, it's dephosphorylated, so it doesn't have the phosphate group. So to activate acetyl-CoA carboxylase, phosphatase catalyzes this and removes the phosphate group. And to inactivate it, protein kinase will phosphorylate acetyl-CoA carboxylase. So we're going to be adding a phosphate group, and we need ATP here. So let's go through what inhibits acetyl-CoA carboxylase hormonally. Now, glucagon is secreted when there is insufficient glucose available. So glucagon, glucose is gone. So when the blood glucose levels decrease, glucagon is secreted. So it's going to inactivate acetyl-CoA, the acetyl-CoA enzyme, and inactivate fatty acid synthesis. And this is the same for epinephrine. Because when we're secreting glucagon, our glucose levels is insufficient, so we don't need to be synthesizing fatty acids. We want to be activating all the pathways so that we could increase glucose. Okay, so glucagon is going to activate cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase, PKA, which is going to phosphorylate ACC, so inhibiting it and inactivating it. So we're going to be slowing down fatty acid synthesis. So glucagon and epinephrine inactivate fatty acid synthesis, which is secreted when blood glucose levels drop. On the other hand, <laughs> if the blood glucose is high, this is going to secrete insulin, which will activate insulin-dependent protein phosphatase, which will dephosphorylate ACC. So we're going to be removing the phosphate group and activating acetyl-CoA carboxylase. So acetyl-CoA carboxylase is what catalyzes the reaction that takes acetyl-CoA and produces malonyl-CoA leading to fatty acid synthesis. So now let's take everything we've discussed about fatty acid synthesis and apply it to the big picture. Acetyl-CoA carboxylase is going to be activated by citrate and insulin is going to dephosphorylate or removing that phosphate group from acetyl-CoA carboxylase and activating it. Now, palmitate, the end product, is going to inhibit acetyl-CoA carboxylase, slowing down the production of malonyl-CoA. And the hormones glucagon and epinephrine inactivate fatty acid synthesis because glucagon is secreted when glucose is low. So glucagon, glucose is gone. So we don't need to make fatty acids. We need to produce energy. So when we have low blood glucose levels, we're going to be activating the processes and pathways that produce energy, and we're going to be deactivating the processes and pathways that store energy. So that is the regulation of fatty acid synthesis. Let's now move on to the regulation of fatty acid oxidation. So quick recap of how this oxidation occurs. The first step is we need to activate the fatty acid and convert it to a fatty acyl CoA. This is catalyzed by fatty acyl CoA synthetase. And the reason why we need to transport the fatty acid into mitochondria is because the enzymes involved in fatty acid oxidation is found within the mitochondrial matrix. Then in the second step, the CoA is going to be substituted for carnithine to form fatty acyl carnithine. This is formed in the outer membrane by carnithine acyltransferase 1. So then it's going to move into the matrix by passive transport through the acylcarnithine co-transporter. And once it's in the matrix, the fatty acyl group is transferred to CoA. So we're going to be putting the CoA back. And this is catalyzed by carnithine acyltransferase 2, which is found in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So then we have this free carnithine here, and this carnithine is going to go through the carnithine co-transporter, move back to the intermembrane space, to the outer membrane, where it can repeat this process. So fatty acyl-CoA here is going to undergo beta oxidation. Okay, so the rate-limiting step for fatty acid oxidation is the reaction involving carnithine acyltransferase 1 which is responsible for the transport of fatty acids into the matrix for beta oxidation. So what inhibits this step is malonyl-CoA, because when the concentration of malonyl-CoA increases, it signals that there is excess energy or excess glucose. The cell has enough energy, so it's going to convert it into fatty acids 
for storage. Okay, so melanyl inhibits this step. Now, there are also two enzymes of beta oxidation that are also regulated. So the first enzyme that is allosterically regulated is beta hydroxyacyl coy dehydrogenase. So when the concentration of NADH is high, so the ratio of NADH NAD plus is high, it's going to allosterically inhibit beta hydroxyacyl coy dehydrogenase. Because high concentration of NADH signals that the cell has enough energy. And the other enzyme is thiolase. And acetyl CoA is going to inhibit thiolase. So there's how one inhibits fatty acid oxidation. Let's now talk about what activates it. Now, when we oxidize fatty acids, we can yield energy. So similar to how we harness energy from glucose oxidation or amino acids. So during muscle contraction, when we're exercising, our muscles, our cells are going to consume and use ATP. So the concentration of ATP is going to decrease, and this is going to increase the concentration of AMP. So AMP is going to activate fatty acid oxidation. So let's break down how it does this. So let's bring back the two forms of acetyl-CoA carboxylase, the active and inactive form. So AMP is going to activate AMPK, the AMP-activated protein kinase. And so this is going to phosphorylate acetyl-CoA carboxylase, inhibiting its activity, inhibiting malonyl-CoA formation. So when the levels of malonyl-CoA decrease, there is no inhibitor for the fatty acyl carnitine transport or carnitine acyl transferase 1. So it's going to activate beta oxidation, allowing it to proceed. So when the concentration of AMP increases, when our muscles are contracting, when we're consuming and breaking down ATP, it's going to activate fatty acid oxidation. So AMP is going to activate AMPK, which is going to phosphorylate acetyl-CoA carboxylase, inhibiting the formation of malonyl-CoA. And this is going to decrease the levels of malonyl-CoA, which means there is no inhibitor for the fatty acyl carnitine transport. So beta oxidation is going to be activated. So now let's take all this and apply it to the big picture, taking both fatty acid synthesis and degradation. So malonyl-CoA inhibits carnitine acyl transferase 1, and the concentration of NADH NAD plus ratio inhibits the enzyme in beta oxidation. And acetyl-CoA also inhibits a beta oxidation enzyme. Thiolase. So that is the regulation of fatty acid synthesis and degradation. In this lecture, we learned how these two pathways are integrated, what the key enzymes are, and how they are regulated allosterically and hormonally. We talked about how when we have high levels of glucose, fatty acid synthesis is going to be activated, and when our blood glucose levels drop, we're going to be activating fatty acid oxidation. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to EKG Science so you don't miss a single lecture. And remember, subtract complexity and slow it down. To study the next lecture, simply click the next video or you can view the entire metabolism playlist. Hey, stop procrastinating!